The following interview was conducted with Lewis J. Reynolds, Professor Emeritus of Diagnostic Medicine, School of Veterinary Medicine for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, July 29, 2009 at Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good afternoon, Dr. Reynolds. Thank, Thank you. you. Tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Well, I was born in Kansas, in Wichita, Kansas, in the Wesley Hospital in uh, June 13th, 1925. And I went to school in the schools in Wichita. And then... Uh, what was grade school like? Small? Well... Large. No, well, yes, okay. in a sense. I've almost forgotten what grade school was like. But uh, anyway, I graduated from Wichita High School North and I went uh, the following summer to summer school at Wichita University and took a couple of courses out there and then came to Kansas State University in the fall. And uh, What year would that have been that you entered? Let's see. That would have been uh, 1942, I believe that's okay. right. During the war? Yes, yes. And I graduated young, and as a consequence, I was not called to the service during that first year of pre-veterinary medicine. By the way, veterinary medicine did not require two years of pre-veterinary medicine at that time, just one year. I got through the first year of pre-veterinary medicine and was admitted to the veterinary school in June. And I was not 17 until June 13th. On June 13th, I was sent to Fort Leavenworth and inducted into the service and then sent back to veterinary school. So I was in veterinary school in the service, in the ASTP program. And so we went year round, three semesters a year. So I graduated in 1946 in February, but prior to that time, the war had begun to wind down in 1945, and they decided they didn't need us in at that time. In now, when we graduated, we would have been commissioned as first lieutenants, second lieutenants, sorry, in the service, in the veterinary corps. And this was all during this period, was doctors, nurses, dental period, dental, dental people, uh, medical people were in the service. Getting well, excuse me, what was campus like during that time during the Well, war? it was a very busy place. We stayed in the at fraternity houses that had been confiscated at that time by the government. And so you had bunks on the first floor and study rooms on the second floor. And uh, we fell out at 545 in the morning to march and from my place, clear across campus to a mess hall. In formation, you marched? Yes, absolutely. And then we came back from the mess hall, and the veterinary school was nearby, but it did not start until, as I recall, 7.30 or 8 o'clock. So we'd all sit around in the hallways and fall asleep. So that's the way it was. And at that time, there was a Navy V-2 program. There was another Army Engineers program. All of these people were in school, in the service. So it was a busy place right. with Army people. Not many undergraduates that were no. there. No. Mm -hmm. okay. There weren't very many civilians sure. on campus at that time. Okay. Did you get uh, a stipend? Did you get any stipend at all for that? Yes, oh. $32 a month. Did they pay for you going to school, too? Uh, pay they paid tuition? for our books. Oh, okay, but not tuition or anything like that? Yes, oh. yeah, the whole thing. The Army paid, paid for that. So essentially, we had a scholarship with the Army and in uniform. Mm -hmm. So before we got out, then we were discharged. I think I paid then the last year 
of veterinary school as a civilian, and we were active reserves. When I graduated from veterinary school, then I came to Indiana. People have asked me why I came to Indiana instead of staying out west. And I had grown up during the Depression and in an area of Kansas where we were impacted by the dust storms. And it was a bad time. And I thought maybe rather than look at Kansas or Nebraska or somebody, some place in that area, that maybe I ought to kind of look around the world a little bit. At that time, veterinarians would send in a request for a veterinarian to associate with them. And uh, I read a letter on the bulletin board in the veterinary school, and it was from this veterinarian in Garrett, Indiana, Dr. Fred Hall. And I thought, well, maybe this might be an opportunity. An opportunity. So I sent him a letter, sent him a picture, and he called on a Sunday morning. Now, I had a date with my wife-to-be to go to church that morning. So he called while we were in church. So when I got out, they told me that this call had come in. So I called him back, and we talked about it. And I told him what I really needed was experience. And he said, well, OK. He said, you must be okay if you're in church this morning. He says, you come on. So that's the way that happened, with no personal interview. And it was a different recruiting. They just put a, an ad on the, on the board, huh? Yes. So I, uh, I rode the uh, train from uh, Wichita to Fort Wayne, and the veterinarian's son met me in Fort Wayne. And Garrett being 20 miles north of Fort Wayne is where I arrived. I can recall my father saying to me just before I got on the train, he said, now son, he said, those people back east, they're different from us and they're not as friendly. And he said, you're gonna have to, to learn to live with that. And that was his perception of where I was going with back east. So I arrived there, and everybody was friendly, so it was okay. You were talking about, did you meet your, did you get married, did you meet your wife there in Kansas? Yes, I met my wife in school, uh -huh. and uh, was she, she, she was in school in business administration. And she, uh, she had two years to go after I graduated. And I wasn't sure whether this was all whole until I got, after I got up in Indiana. And uh, so I said, I asked her dad, I said, you know, Nancy and I'd like to get married. And he said, Nancy will finish college. And I said, yes, sir. So that's the way it was. Okay. And it helped. Sure, that's right. And it still helped right. after 61 years. What sort of practice was this? Did you know what kind of practice it was? Yes, I knew that it would be a dairy practice primarily. And we did a lot of artificial insemination. We, at that time, uh, he, Dr. Hall, had a dairy farm. He had a good Guernsey bull, and we would collect semen from that bull, and we would inseminate uh, cows in other dairy herds in the area, Guernsey herds, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it, when I first got there, involved that kind of activity all over the county of DeKalb, and. Uh, so I covered a lot of miles mm -hmm. that first year okay. and got a lot of experience, right. which I really needed. Right. We did a little small animal practice, but it was pretty primitive. Sure. Right. Let me ask you this. In your vet class, were there um, girls in the class? Was it, or were they all? No. Huh? There were no females in my class. There was in the class just after. Okay. Two. And I don't recall yeah. before. Was it a very large class? I mean, considering you're in the Yes, war? there were about 72 in the oh, class. Oh, okay. Good mm -hmm. size. Yeah. Okay. So now you're in practice. 
So I was in practice in Garrett, and I was there for four years. Uh, Dr. Hall came down here as an extension veterinarian, and he had done extension work, dairy extension work, uh, prior to that time, periodically. Mm -hmm. And he came here, and I was there by myself for two years after that. I leased the practice. And then I went to the mailbox one morning, and it said, greetings. And that was the end of that. And Did you get married then before that? Or yes, okay. we, Nancy and I were married. Uh -huh. and, uh, so then I went to the service. I was stationed in, at first in Kansas City. Well, prior to that, we spent two months in the Meat and Dairy Hygiene School in Chicago to get oriented to what the Army did, which was primarily to uh, service contracts that were let by the Quartermaster Corps and the Army Veterinary Corps then serviced those contracts in the packing plants and uh, any food producing plants. So we were responsible for inspection of all foods of animal origin. Of course, that would include meat, milk, eggs, whatever was of animal origin. And this was for all services, excepting the Air Force. So we shipped food to uh, the Mar for the Marines, for the Navy, and for the Army, to all not branches the, of the service except the Air Force. And, not the Air the and not Coast Guard. Beg your pardon? Not the Coast Guard. I presume the Coast Guard. I don't recall okay, okay. shipping food to the Coast Guard. Okay. And a lot of these at that time were overseas shipment because the Korean War was going sure. on. And the Korean War then kind of wound down. And I decided that I wasn't ready to give up practice, and so I went back into practice in Darlington in 1955 after I got out of the service. Mm -hmm. And I was in partnership with Dr. Henry Lidicke and Dr. John Coltrane there. So we had a three-way partnership. Dr. Coltrane was in Thorntown and I was in Darlington. Both small communities, both agricultural practices. And at that point in time, it was primarily uh, swine in that area. So we got very much involved with uh, swine veterinary medicine. The activities at that time included a lot of vaccination for hog cholera, now called swine fever, now called classical swine fever. And, uh, but at that time, it was known as hog cholera. And so we vaccinated hogs for hog cholera to prevent uh, the disease. And we had a few hog cholera outbreaks where people did not vaccinate. And we used a live virus and an antiserum to vaccinate these pigs with. So the live virus actually could produce the hog cholera if you didn't give the antiserum. Sure. This produced a tremendously powerful immunity. So these were lifelong immunities when you vaccinated these pigs. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, they Eradic to eradicate hog cholera, they decided to eradicate the use of the live virus and for several years used a modified uh, live virus and eventually outlawed the use of any vaccine and went into the kill and slaughter program to eradicate hog cholera, to which has stayed eradicated even sure. to this time. Right. Yeah. I was on the Hog cholera eradication committee for a while in Indiana. Well, that kind of takes me through the practice time. Okay, and then next would be Purdue. Yes, in 1969, uh, there was an opening here in the area of surgery. And I had known Dr. Hal Amstutz, who was the head of clinics at that time. And uh, we talked one time, and so I was 
interviewed for that. I had to come up and make a presentation in front of the class. I was very nervous. But apparently it must have been okay because I was hired as a visiting professor. And that was for one year. And then I was uh, hired as an associate professor after that. Good. And I was an associate professor. I'd have to look I think until uh, 1975 and I was promoted to professor of large animal medicine and surgery. And along about that time, the whole agricultural industry began to change away from small uh, operations where you would have a few sows and some pigs and pasture operations where you'd see the hog houses scattered out across the field and those would be for farrowing houses and one sow to a house and you'd have a litter of pigs within those houses. And then it began to go more and more to initially to bringing the, all the farrowing operation inside. So the sows would farrow inside, and then the pigs would go to pasture after that. And eventually, it moved on to total confinement, and uh, from farrow to finish to market. And we began to see, and I think I'd have to give Dr. Ken Meyer and the dean, Dean Stockton at that time, and we had talked about this, that agriculture was changing and that we would need to begin to think about how we would service large groups of animals, not only pigs, but dairies, uh, beef cattle, these kinds of things. And as they began to integrate and get away from the small herds and flocks that were on the farms. And so, and at that time, as this was happening, the realization took place that the sophistication of the livestock industry had reached a point where the people that had livestock were pretty well educated and they, they did a lot of their own work and we even had one producer that said well I don't know how to use a veterinarian anymore because we went from treating individual animals then we had to begin to look at how do we treat and take care of large groups of animals and we began to think well the best way would be when you collect a bunch of animals under one roof that perhaps preventive practices would be better and that we could act in a consultative and advisory capacity. And the dean wanted our students to be able to have those concepts that would apply across the board, whether it was a kennel or a equine breeding operation or swine, cattle, whatever. So he said, well, I don't know how to tell you to do it, but he said, you do it. So I said, okay, because I'd had this in the back of my mind for some time. So we'd look at all kinds of things, vaccinations, uh, preventive practices as far as entering a premises, the possibility of carrying disease, the introduction of breeding stock. And so that's how we got into that. And uh, we kind of felt our way along with it. And one of the producers that I went to had been a former client of mine down by Linden. His name was Richard Ward. And Richard had a pretty good sized swine herd. And he was getting more and more confined and concentrated all the time. 
So I went down and talked to Richard and said to him, this is what we want to do. He said, I'll, you just do it. So he, he was our first client. And as we worked with Richard, he began to see the benefits of this kind of medicine and so he told other people, and pretty soon we were so busy we didn't know what to do. That happens. Initially, by the way, our concept of, of this program was to have swine herd, dairy herd, beef cattle, and sheep. And so to show you how neat and naive I was in thinking about this concept and and giving this kind of service, the dean wanted me to kind of write up how I might want to do this. So I put it down on a piece of paper, and I wish I had that yet. But what I put down was, well, we'll try and have 10 swine herds, 10 beef herds, 10 dairy herds, and, and 10 sheep herds as demonstration herds. And I went in and showed this to Dr. Page, who was head of clinics at that time. He says, you're going to be a busy fellow. I <laughs> bet. <laughs> and I uh, began to realize as we got into this, and it, it developed in the swine area, that I was going to be very busy. And being an old practitioner, I could not turn down the opportunity to take on new herds. So, along with this, the clerkship program developed within the veterinary school in which students could spend a month uh, in various areas, small animal, equine, and in my case, the herd health, we call it, herd health management. And so, I would have two or three students on block for one month that would go to the farms with me. And this was to help them learn the concepts, what to look for, all kinds of things. That they would encounter. Ventilation, uh, manure disposable, disposal, disease prevention, and have them interact at the same time that I was going through the premises and looking at what was going on and in some cases diagnosing disease outbreaks. And so this would give them on-farm experience and a background in how to handle this kind of, of practice. So also I had uh, didactic at least once a week in the classroom which we taught the swine diseases primarily, and taught preventive, taught preventive practices, some of which included on some farms. As we progressed in this and began to be concerned about the possibility of humans bringing disease to on their person, on their, their shoes, uh, some of our producers started putting in showers and then you would undress on one side, shower, and they would furnish the clothes and the boots on the other side. And then when you got through, you showered back out. And this became somewhat of a concern when we started having women. But it all worked out. And uh, they seemingly very accommodating to the situation and uh, the only thing is I think uh, what was it one one lady told me she said he didn't have anything but men's shorts over on the other side <laughs> but I made the best of it right that yeah was, but, yeah, but right. they did sure sure and so we did all kinds of things testing when when we were doing pseudorabies work uh, testing pigs, and I had students help with that, taught them how to bleed, take blood samples, which is much different with a pig than it is from, right. from cattle right. and other species. How far afield did you go? 
for the I went as I, I went as far as Wilkett. I had two herds up there, one in Linden. Oh, I went clear down by Terre Haute for one herd. He mm -hmm. came up and wanted us to start coming on his farm. And he was a very progressive guy, still is, and still in the pig business, and was a wonderful person. Uh, after I retired, uh, the person that took over, uh, they had a little pond, kind of a lake, and uh, they built a place down there and the students could stay there. And so the students would stay there for three or four days and help with the work on the farm, even, in the, in the swine barns. So they get some idea what, what it what takes to produce pigs under those kind of conditions. So the, he was a, a wonderful help. Mm -hmm. So that's about it. And then along about 1984, I began to wear pretty thin with this. And I had- It takes a lot. There's a lot yeah. of work to be involved in that. Yeah, well, actually- Being on the farm. Well, being on the farm. And then when we would get back, well, one farm, you asked how far, was clear up by Butler. Oh, wow. And uh, uh, that was an excellent farm, too. In fact, they built a whole brand new facility up there, and I was kind of in on helping them plan uh, that facility. And they still, I think they still go up there to that farm. Not as frequently. I went uh, once a month, I think. Would you sometimes have to stay more than one day? No. Oh. No, usually not. I usually okay. try to work it in so that we could do it all in one day. Okay. But you mentioned in Terre Haute that now they could stay for a couple yes, of days. Yes, but not when I started. Right, that okay. but now they have that option. Yeah, I think they have that option. Okay. And I think they still go down there, too. Mm -hmm. uh, then I had Dr. Bolin was a graduate student, and we got in, and he helped on some of these farms, and uh, I, took, I had him do a farm uh, down by Linden, another farm down there. And uh, then we got into the embryo transfer thing, which was a surgical procedure. And we were going to try to develop that so that we could do that, take the embryos here at Purdue and transport them to the farm and put them in. We got that far and we weren't very successful. And I'm not sure why, primarily because it required the producer to have a very, very uh, precise uh, ability to understand when the sow came in heat and when she would ovulate. <laughs> and some of our producers that we tried this with just didn't have it right. And so we'd flush the embryos and they wouldn't be fertile or they were too far gone or something like this. So it wasn't it was very successful, thing. but we did do the work relative to the virus. Dr. Don Gustafson up in the virology at uh, the veterinary school helped us with this. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Bolin went on and got his PhD then with Dr. Gustafson. And now Dr. Bolin is head of the pathology laboratory at Michigan State University. My second graduate student was Dr. Alan Scheidt. And Dr. Scheidt had graduated, was out working for a couple of years, and he was in a small animal practice in St. Louis, he wasn't too happy with it. And I offered him the opportunity to come back in and go to graduate school and get his master's degree. And so Dr. Scheidt was more oriented to working on the farm than Dr. Bolin was. And uh, so we did a lot of work together uh, on the farm. And uh, we, Dr. Scheidt eventually after I went to the diagnostic lab in 84, he carried the program for a couple of years and he had an opportunity to go with Pfizer, I think it was. And he's still with Pfizer and he's over on the East Coast in South North Carolina, South Carolina, the big confined hog producing areas there. 
and acting as a uh, consultant there. I decided to go over to the diagnostic lab. We had tried to get somebody to come in and work with us. In the large animal? In, in the large animal, as in this area. Mm -hmm. And I just couldn't find somebody that for me was satisfactory. And I thought, I just can't keep on doing this. I was neglecting my wife. I, I, had, the, I had the chance to go over into the diagnostic lab and work uh, there with the problems that would come into the diagnostic lab where you couldn't solve them in the diagnostic lab. And so I went out into the field so I traveled all over the state on these kinds of things that veterinarians would call. And I would, we did it for veterinarians. And uh, the owner would have to go through the veterinarian. The veterinarian would call and want me to come and look at the situation. So I came to the farms and evaluated what I saw on the farm. And we tried to correlate that with the diagnostic find findings in the laboratory. Very challenging very challenging and that was all species and I was a little bit rusty on cattle and this kind of thing but we got it done mm -hmm. and then I retired in 1990. 1990, is that right? Okay. And I thought about doing consulting afterwards but I told my wife and she put up with this all these years in practice and, and here at Purdue and I said Nancy I will not do anything for a year and then at the end of a year, if I'm getting antsy and I don't have enough to do, I said, uh, I may try the consulting game. And so we had so much fun the first year, I said, to heck with that. I'm not going to do that either. So I haven't. Let me go back to And you. not only that, let me say this. Sorry. I educated some pretty good young men who went out in the field and are now still doing this kind of thing. And I thought, why do I want to go out and compete with the students that I educated? They can do the job, not me. And that's the way it is, and they do it better than I do. So. I have a question for the researchers. The diagnostic lab, could you just clarify what sort of things were you involved? I know you mentioned it, but th there would be problems on the farm and they would contact the school or, or well, primarily large? I'm thinking of the term veterinarians. Right? The veterinarians send samples and okay. animals and these kinds of things into, the, into the diagnostic lab. Okay. And the pathologists there do the work on the floor and some of the diagnostic work, both gross and microscopic. And I did some of that on the floor, but uh, especially with pigs. But when they could not find a good answer to the kind of problem that the history showed was occurring on the farm. Then I went to the farm and tried to see what it was on the farm, collected additional samples, and tried to determine what more could we could do, and by my own observations, what could be done on the farm to help solve the problem. Okay. Okay. So I went, my gosh, all the way from northern Indiana and southern Indiana, those kind of things. And that was a lot of fun. That's right. I really enjoyed that. Yeah, that's right. I, yeah. I don't blame you. Yeah. <laughs> the school that you, um, let's talk a little about the deans. When you first came, was Dr. Morris and then Dr. Dr. Erskine Morris was the okay. dean for the first year. And then that uh, transfer took place to uh, Dr. Jack Stockton. And then after Jack Stockton, it was Hugh Lewis. Okay. And he was there when I retired. Did you uh, opt for the voluntary uh, retirement, or did you decide to just retire? Well, was I retired. I was 65. And okay. I but, you, but did you not have the option for that voluntary going half time for a while? I did. Oh. Okay. But I decided not to. Okay. Not to so do that. I have yeah. not sure when that came in, but I know some. I'm not sure either, and yeah. I am not sure that option was given to me. Uh, Dr. Thacker was head of the diagnostic lab at that time, and. I, uh, he said to me, he said, now you don't have to retire. Sure. 
And I suppose part of that was because of you can't force somebody out. But the I, option. But I think maybe there might have been an option there, but I decided not to. Right. I had decided when I was 65, if I could financially do it, that I would retire. Right. And that's why. Let's talk a little about your family. Do you have, any, do you have children? I have two sons. Okay. One is a veterinarian. And where does he practice? And he, do, he's, he, got his, he had clean kennels when he was a kid and go to some of the farms and do some of the dirty jobs, help me with some of the dirty jobs that I had to do. On the farm? Yeah, and he decided that maybe he didn't want to make a life of that. So he went on to Iowa State. After he, graduated, he went to Purdue and got his DVM and then went on to Iowa State and got his PhD. And he now works with Pfizer in uh, as an investigator and associate investigator of animal research up at Kalamazoo. So he's, um, he, he's not into the ground practice yeah. kind of thing. And my other son is an attorney, and he's in Fort Collins, Colorado. Okay. He's the older. Okay. Did, they, did he also go to Purdue? Uh, no, he went to Indiana University. Oh, it's okay. It's well, he went, first he went to uh, Hanover. Okay. And graduated there, and then went on to Indiana, Indiana University in law school. And Paul went to DePaul, uh -huh. and then came here to veterinary school. That sounds good. Yeah. Let's talk a little about some of your. Were you ever a fact fellow at uh, the faculty fellow program? No. Oh, okay. No, I was um, not. I didn't have time. <laughs> I know. Now it's changed a lot because of the. Well, it, I'm a fact fellow at Tarkington, and now that the eating facilities, they, yeah, uh, you have to go to the uh, bigger ones, so it yeah. makes a difference. You got. Um, in uh, the Meritorious from Indiana Pork Producers Association, the Meritorious Service Award in 1984. How yes. about the, and also the Howard Dunn Memorial Award, which is nice. That was given by the American Association of Swine Veterinarians, the national organization. Were you a little, did you know about them in advance? Surprise? No, okay. I did not. As a matter of fact, my wife and I had taken a two week vacation in Hawaii. And I got home just in time to go to the meeting. And I was at the meeting. I had no idea that that was going to happen. So That's that, sort of nice, though. Yes, a little it bit was. of a surprise Very nice. then. And then also, you got the National Specific Pathogen Free Swine Accrediting Agency Service Award yes. in the 70s. Yeah. And that's very nice. I was, I was very much involved with that because I recognized early on that that was a preventive program and that the concepts of the SPF program where they would cesarean the sow and raise the pigs ar under artificial conditions, separate them completely from the sow aseptically and raise them aseptically up to a certain age and they would have to be carefully tended and fed uh, was a way of separating the pig from the sow who could transmit disease to the pig. And the concepts of that program were such. And then on the on-farm concepts were the same, very restricted entry. Everybody was in that program, had their gates posted, no entry, and uh, very careful, uh, especially in concern for transmission of disease into swine herds. So the idea of the SPF program I knew about long before I came to Purdue mm -hmm. and I like the concepts mm -hmm. that has now been replaced and the SPF program is no more no longer active because Dr. Kirk Clark who came here developed the concept of medicated early weaning so they wean these pigs at 10 or 11 days of age separate them separate them from the south and then raise them on a separate premises from the premises where pigs were feral and finished in order to keep that transmission of disease down from parent stock to young. And that became uh, very effective. And so you didn't have to go through all the cesarean business and this kind of thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The SPF herds had what they call primary herds. These were, these were herds in which the pigs were delivered by cesarean, 
all of their pigs. These primary herds then would be the seed stock herds for what they call secondary herds. So the secondary herds then would take offspring as breeding stock from those primary herds to establish a secondary SPF herd. The way this was monitored was to go to the packing plant and there were three diseases that we were primi primarily concerned with at that time, and that was what was called atrophic rhinitis, which was a disease of the snout, which distorted the snout, affected their growth rates and feet conversions, and the mycoplasmal pneumonia, which also affected growth rates and feet conversion and susceptibility to other respiratory disease, and dysentery which at that time was called uh, the dysentery. Now I've forgotten, it's gone through so many transitions, they call it something else now. But easily transmissible. And so uh, those were the three diseases that was primarily developed to control. And so I got involved with the SPF Association and eventually was very involved with it. And, uh, I liked the people that were in it, and uh, they all had similar concepts to what I had, and very cooperative. And A lot of but we did. But we, I went to the packing plant and did all of the slaughter inspections, and the whole program was based on whether you identified any of these three problems at the slaughter plant. So you could identify lesions of atrophic rhinitis and also lesions of uh, mycoplasma pneumonia. And you could sort out the, the pneumonia from other kinds of pneumonia because mycoplasma had particularly significant lesions both grossly and microscopically. And so we were able to determine whether those herds had somehow become infected. So that's how we did it. And I took students to the packing plant. And for the most part, students had never been inside a slaughter plant. I'm sure. And never seen what went on there. And some students were turned off and some students weren't. But anyway, it gave them a chance to see, see what, what happened right. at the end. And I'd take them, the, the packing plant allowed me to take the students all the way down to the packing plant, all the way through the sausage area, bacon areas, uh, so that they could see the end products and how they were how they were made, and how sausage was made, and bacon was made, and wieners, and all of this kind of thing. It's a continuum <coughs> you need to see from beginning yes, to end. Yes, yes. So we, we were able to do that, and uh, it was uh, very interesting to a lot of students, and very educational for the most part. Well, it adds a nice dimension to their curriculum and the, yeah, and the yeah. program of study, I think is okay. Uh, let's see, how about, um, tell us about your retirement activities, what you've been doing, and some hobbies that you may have. Oh, my. Well. You decided to stay here in Lafayette, I gather. Yes, we okay. did. Okay. And in 1973, my wife and I went to Hawaii for the first time on our 25th wedding anniversary. And we decided that we might like to go back there again. And subsequently, while I was still working, I think we went back a couple of times. And then after that, with the exception of 1990, when two friends and their wives, we went to Australia and New Zealand and took that trip down that way. But on the other hand, after I retired, we went to Hawaii each winter in about February. You stayed for a period of time? Yeah, we stayed as long as four weeks, and it eventually stretched into six weeks, and that got to be a t little too long, so we <laughs> cut it back to five or four weeks. Right. And we thoroughly enjoyed it, and I did. I liked to snorkel. and, and uh, That's a nice time of the year to yeah, go there. And the island of Maui, where we stayed up on the west northwest end of Maui, the beaches there are such that you don't have to take a boat out to go snorkeling. And you could just go right off the beach and the coral reefs are right out there. 
I was absolutely stunned and fascinated by that the first time I went, and so I went snorkeling a lot every time the ocean was calm enough to do so. Sure, right. So that was one of the things that we've done. Now, the airplane ride over there has gotten harder and harder, and I don't know whether it's with age or just the way the airlines operate. Like but smaller seats oh, and... God. They're just uh, so crowded and cramped, and so we went. Uh, do you you can't you can't go nonstop though. You go to California or something. You have to you have to go to Dallas. Oh, Dallas. Okay. And on the American. Yeah. And then on American now, you can fly straight into Maui. It, formerly, you had to fly into Honolulu and take a commuter flight over. But it's not like it used to be getting there and getting back. And Hawaii has been used pretty hard too and I've seen a lot of changes over the years. I bet you have. So we didn't go this winter. Okay. Did you so take a second uh, alternative or you no, just didn't go? No, we you just stayed, stayed home and watched the snowflakes. <laughs> and what, that freezing cold weather in January. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it wasn't so bad. Yeah. But the last time when we got home, we just had realized that we were so tired and it took us a week to get over that right. airplane ride. Do you uh, have back. a And you have to fly overnight. Do you have a condo out there? Do you rent a condo when no, you're there? No, oh. we had one that uh, we stayed in for several years, oh, okay. and we would just rent it. We had a friend that owned a condo in Hawaii and over on the Big Island, and he told us one time, he and a, it was kind of a consortium, several people, sure. and he told us one time, he said, don't buy a condo. He said, you'll never come out on it. And so we never did. So when we closed the door and came home, we didn't have to worry about it. Oh, that's pretty good. Okay. How about, uh, do you have an outstanding event in your life that you'd like to share with us that comes to mind? Oh, my. There's maybe, there can be more than one. Well, I think probably my wife consenting to marry me was probably the that's most right. outstanding event. And what a wonderful wife. She's been great. And you enjoyed a lot of things together. Oh, which yes. Is great. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Yeah. And I'm going to leave you to make some closing comments and whatever, how you'd like to summarize or things that, something that we didn't ask that you'd like to share with us. Oh, my. It's been a good ride all the way through. And uh, I... Uh, it's nice to be I've here for the school. I guess I've person. had some people. Yes, it was. And it was a great experience being here at Purdue University. And I had people here... They were willing to help me. And when I first came into the surgery clinic, I was a little rusty on the kind of surgeries that I had to do. And Dr. Jack Fessler was head of surgery then, and he helped me a lot. And I'd be forever grateful to him for, for this. And uh, after I got off into this other thing, I didn't do much surgery after right. that. Uh -huh. But... Uh, and the school has grown and changed over time. Oh, yes. You've got their facilities have expanded, too. Yes, they have, especially in the small animal. I'm particularly impressed. I'm, I'm uh, part of the Purdue University Retirees Association, and uh, I, I'm on the community and campus visit. Okay. And I set up a visit to the veterinary school last spring, and... Uh, so a, a group of people went through, and I hadn't been through the large animal clinic in which my office had been, and the small animal clinic for a long time, and I was astounded at the technology that's there now. I'd be totally lost. It's just it's changed so much, as it should be. Sure, All right. You have to, All right? Yeah. yeah. So I'm impressed with our veterinary school, and I'm impressed with Purdue University, and I've enjoyed being here at Purdue University, and I enjoyed being with the people that I work for in practice, and, and my partners in practice. And the students. And students, right. yes. Nice. And I've had some wonderful students. You still keep in touch? Yeah, oh, yes, 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 indeed. It's nice to see where they go next and what they're currently yeah. doing and things yeah. of that sort. Some of them, one of my students, uh, who went into a swine practice only, swine consulting practice only, down in Columbus, Indiana, 
is now consulting four times a year for swine operations in China. And I don't, I, I'm not sure, I, I just got him started and he did the rest, but he's, he's really become quite uh, astute. And let's see, one, two, three, four, four of the students that I can think of, and maybe five, have become presidents of the American Association of Swine Veterinarians subsequently yeah. during their career. So this has been rewarding. Really it is, nice. it really is. And so I guess that's the most rewarding thing. Very good. And that's very nice. Thank you, Dr. Reynolds, mm -hmm. very much. I appreciate that.